building on the topic of atomics, let's suppose that we maybe want to uh, take things up a level. So ask yourself, do free lunches exist? Certainly, uh, Boromir would say one does not simply refuse a free lunch. Uh, so the idea is that if we want to operate in a world in which there are no locks, could we do that? Obviously, we have to you know, respect some rules. We can't just do anything we want. But would this work? So if you have a map, you know, a hash map or something like that, and it's shared between threads, the normal thing to do would be there are some uh, concurrency controls, protect the access to that map with a mutex, a lock of some sort. But what if you wrote the data structure in a way that you didn't have to do that? That might be a lock-free data structure. Uh, and a fair amount of research has gone into this. Um, it, it has uh, produced some versions of lock-free data structures. Uh, some are easier to make than others. Um, but uh, in all, all honesty, they're not for every situation, as we will see. So let's investigate at least a little bit. Um, so before we get too much farther, I want to suggest to you that um, use these things wisely. Um, often normal locking and unlocking behavior is sufficient for your program. Um, as long as you are avoiding the possibility of deadlock by enforcing ordering or something like that, um, then usually locking and unlocking is fine. Uh, the most common scenarios for where it's very important to do something like a non-lock uh, uh, containing data structure or lock-free data structure is when you have to guarantee that progress is made, uh, when you can't use locks for some reason, uh, or where you are really concerned if a thread dies at a bad time while holding onto a lock, it means the whole system hangs or something like that. Before uh, getting too much farther into this, we should think about uh, a couple of tiny details. Uh, and uh, a non-blocking data structure is the first thing that we'll look at. Um, I'll assume we've discussed blocking enough uh, where we are now and what non-blocking things are, a spin lock or try lock behavior. Uh, is familiar to us, so we don't have to go into that. But a non-blocking data structure is one in which none of the operations can result in getting blocked. Uh, in some languages, uh, standard collections, you know, Java has a concurrent hash map. Uh, there is a concurrency controlled data structure in which locking and unlocking is handled for you, but it still exists, and you can still end up getting blocked. Lock-free data structures are inherently non-blocking, um, but it does not necessarily go the other way. Uh, a uh, spin lock or busy waiting approach is not lock-free because if a thread that's holding the lock is suspended, then everybody else is stuck waiting to acquire it. So we should be a little bit careful that um, just because um, lock-free data structures are always non-blocking, it doesn't mean that structures that have locks can be you know, always used in a way that doesn't allow blocking. So a lock-free data structure doesn't use locks. Well, okay, that is by definition the case, duh. Uh, but there's implication that it is also thread safe. So you can't make your uh, algorithm a uh, use a lock-free data structure just by deleting all the locks and saying, yep, we're done. Um, lock-free doesn't also necessarily mean it's a free-for-all where all operations are allowed and all operations can happen concurrently and everything. There might have to be some rules that specify here are limitations that you can use the lock-free data structure provided you are willing to accept this this proviso. Um, so a queue might allow one thread to append to the end but another one removing from the front but you can't have two removals at the same time. Something like that is a potential restriction that you could face when using a lock-free data structure, even though it's not the ideal. Uh, the ideal world is all operations are allowed and you must uh, be able to do everything at the same time, but unfortunately that is not always going to be possible, uh, and we'll do the best we can with what we've got. The actual definition of lock-free is a little bit more formal, so I'll give you the formal definition now. Uh, and that is that if any thread performing an operation gets suspended during that operation, then all other threads accessing the data structure are still able to complete their tasks. Okay, it's distinct from the idea of waiting, 
an operation might still have to wait its turn or might get restarted, but wouldn't get stuck uh, in this definition. Um, so uh, when I talk about um, restarting, I mean something along the lines of compare and swap uh, in the atomics section, uh, that if we find that the value has changed uh, from our expectation, then by the rules, uh, we might have to restart our compare and swap operation, and that would be okay. Uh, we would still be getting the same result, but we wouldn't have blocking behavior. Uh, unfortunately, of course, going back and trying again might mean that threads are kind of frequently interrupting each other, uh, which maybe isn't great. Uh, and in some circumstances, what you actually want are weight-free data structures. Okay, uh, weight-free data structures are not entirely exactly what they sound like. It does not mean nothing ever has to wait uh, any, uh, any amount of time. What a weight-free data structure means is that if a thread has to wait, there is a bound on how long it would have to wait. So there's a bounded number of steps regardless of what other threads do. So you may have to wait a little bit for it to be your turn, but there is clearly a limit to how long you will wait. Okay, that's acceptable in that regard. Um, a compare and swap routine with infinite retries is not wait free because an unlucky thread might actually have to retry an infinite number of times uh, and still not succeed. There's no upper bound on how many times you would have to retry before you succeed. Uh, and that means that compare and swap used in this situation is not wait free. Let's look at a simple lock-free algorithm. Uh, there's a, a couple of small modifications I've made uh, from the original source, but we'll look at a lock-free stack. So we will declare a stack. The stack uh, is going to have a head, and the head is an atomic pointer of a node, and node takes a generic type T. Uh, a node contains data and a pointer to the next element. Uh, and then we have a, uh, an implementation here uh, which says when we were creating a stack, we will then uh, initialize it with head being a new atomic pointer, uh, which is pointing to nothing uh, because our stack will start out as empty. Very good. Uh, and to push something onto the stack, well then, uh, it is going to again take a, a generic type T parameter uh, and we will allocate the node, um, we will actually uh, create a box for it and the node will contain the data T uh, and the next pointer will be null because we're, uh, we're going to uh, just create the node as such. Uh, and then in the loop, we are going to get the current head. So we're going to load it ordering sequential consistency as always. Uh, and we will update the next pointer with the snapshot that we took. Uh, and uh, that is to say that we are going to say the next pointer for the node we are creating is the previous head of the list. Uh, and then we will try to compare and swap and say, all right, if the head is still the same as our expectation, then atomically swap that in and make it the new head of the list. Uh, and if it is, then we break out of the loop. Otherwise, we try again, figure out what is the head of the list or head of the stack uh, and then push it. This repeats until we are successful. OK, it's lock free. There's no locks. You'll notice we didn't allocate a mutex anywhere. There's nothing like that. A thread that is unsuccessful just retries until it is successful. Uh, and eventually um, we end up with uh, a value that reflects our desired change. We push the thing into the stack, uh, whether or not uh, it happened on the first try or the 10th try or the 100th try isn't really uh, of concern, but we used our data structure to get the data onto the stack and there were no locks involved. Very good. A particularly unlike, unlucky thread might spend literally forever going around this loop, but that thread's bad luck is somebody else's good luck because the only way a thread is unlucky and fails to push its item into the stack is because another thread pushed its item into the stack. Uh, and this means that there is progress. There's progress in the system, something is happening. You know, items are being added to the stack, 
uh, and possibly also items are being taken off the stack. Uh, we don't show the uh, pop implementation here, but one may assume it exists because what is the purpose of a stack where you only add things and never take them away? Um, but in such a circumstance, there is progress being made in the system. Uh, we are successfully putting things into the uh, into the stack somewhere. Maybe not the current thread, but another thread is getting it done. But it's not weight free because there's no upper bound on how many attempts it takes to successfully put something on. Uh, and a weight free algorithm looks something like this. Uh, if we are incrementing a counter, uh, the atomic uh, fetch add takes a bounded number of steps. Uh, the ordering in which it takes place depends quite a lot on what other threads are trying to do the atomic increment at any given time. Um, but uh, it will it will execute in a fixed number of steps. Uh, and the same is true for decrement counter where we fetch and subtract and if it goes uh, from zero uh, from one to zero, then we successfully decremented it and the print line statement here is going to be um, just a placeholder. Something useful might happen in there instead. Um, and uh, we are certain that both operations complete in a bounded number of steps. There's no possibility that anything is stuck or has to repeat forever. So the question that you must be asking is, does this work? Is it better? Uh, are they somehow better for performance? Um, not necessarily. Lock-free algorithms are really about ensuring that there is forward progress in the system and not specifically about speed. A particular algorithm implementation might be faster under lock-free algorithms depending on how your system is used and how the uh, alternative is written. The compare and swap algorithm to replace a list head is faster than a mutex lock and unlock, and that might be better than um, actually using the lock and unlock version. However, if there's a lot of contention for it and the compare and swap operation has to retry many, many times before it succeeds, you might end up concluding that actually it's not worth it and it's not better and the lock and, um, and unlock approach is preferable. At the end of the day, uh, lock-free algorithms could be slower. They could be faster, but they could be slower. Uh, and in that case, you wouldn't use it just because it's lock-free. You would have to test and see, is it better? If it is, use it. If it's not, it's not. Uh, and in circumstances where you really need a lock-free algorithm for reasons of ensuring there is always forward progress in the system uh, or something to that effect, it could be slower, but you're trading that off against some certainty that there will always be forward progress. So, to lock free or not to lock free, the answer, I'm sorry to say, is it depends. <laughs>